Hey, Walter Sorrells back with more tips for the knife maker. Today, smelting steel. So today I'm just going to give a little tour of a smelt I did recently. If you're not familiar with smelting, the idea here is to roughly duplicate the kind of steel production that would have been done in Japan, say, seven or eight centuries ago, and to produce the sort of primitive steel that's called tamahagane, or jewel steel, in Japan. As you'll see, I'm not making any attempt to use the exact methodologies and materials of medieval Japan. Obviously, they didn't have mechanical blowers or modern concrete or whatever, but the basic idea is still pretty much the same. You have a tube of refractory material, that is, material that can take a lot of heat, in which you burn natural wood charcoal. A blower forces air into the smelter to accelerate the burning of the charcoal. Added to the charcoal is iron ore, that is, a source of iron, in this case, an industrial iron oxide product. So, here I am firing up the smelter. After an hour or two of preheat, first with propane, then with charcoal, the smelter's hot enough to start charging with ore. My friend Michael, who also makes my sheaths for me at Tactics Armory, joins in. Many thanks to Michael. This is hot, tiring work. In Japan, they used iron sand that was scoured out of river bottoms. Red iron oxide is known as hematite, while the black material used in Japan is magnetite. Over the years, I've used all kinds of different ore sources, including true earth ores, as well as various industrial iron oxide products, including magnetite, hematite, specular hematite, a whole bunch of things. Now, strictly speaking, ore is something that you've dug directly out of the ground and contains impurities along with some kind of metallic compound in this case iron oxide but whatever we dump in there we call it ore whether it's a direct earth product or a pure industrial product like i'm using today the working part of the ore is just a chemical combination of iron and oxygen and they all work fine for this process and at the end of the day they work the same way, though you have to tune your processes a little bit to work for each one. In any case, as the ore descends through the smelter, oxygen is stripped from the iron oxide bonding to carbon and leaving pure iron, while the oxygen exits the smelter in the form of carbon dioxide. You know, some people are under the impression that the smelting of ores is basically kind of a melting process, that you're just melting some of the excess stuff out and what's left will be the copper, iron, whatever that you're looking for. This is not at all what happens. You're actually taking chemically bonded materials. You're getting rid of everything that's not the metal that you want so that you're only left with that one metallic material. So with iron smelting, no matter what ore source you use, the chemical processes are identical, though hematite goes through a transformation to magnetite before giving up its oxygen. The iron produced eventually clumps up at the bottom, forming what's known as a bloom. Now, if you get too much carbon in the iron, you end up with a puddle of unusable cast iron. Too little carbon, and you end up with an iron that isn't suitable for sword making. There's a bit of an art to threading this needle and ending up with sword-friendly steel. If you're curious, in modern steel production, the smelting stage of the process always, always produces cast iron. But that's not how the smiths in Japan seven, eight hundred years ago would have done it. Throughout the process, we'll monitor the temperature of the fire and the air pressure as measured by this extremely primitive but effective little gauge. Believe it or not, as crappy as it looks, this is much more sensitive than commercial air pressure gauges. You can't rush the process. If anything gets out of tolerances that I've kind of developed over doing this for some years, you end up ruining the whole batch. Everything about this is time consuming. By the time I lit the smelter today, I've already spent about three or four days chopping charcoal, rebuilding the smelter, just all kinds of work generally getting prepared for the smelt. After running the furnace for most of the day, 
the bloom has formed and slag begins to clog the tuyeres. Those are the air ducts at the bottom of the smelter. Michael and I disassemble the smelter, which is built in sections so that it doesn't have to be completely destroyed in order to take it apart. After this melt, the screaming hot bloom has to be removed with a sledgehammer, destroying the bottom section of the forge. That section has to sacrifice itself to science every time you run the smelter. It'll be recast each time for the next smelt. Whereas, if you're lucky at least, you can recycle the top sections for several smelts before they degrade too much to be serviceable and have to be rebuilt too. By the time it's all over with, the fires consume several hundred pounds of charcoal and nearly a hundred pounds of ore. The bloom here has formed in a number of pieces which are separated. There are also a lot of little bits and pieces that we kind of hoover up as we go along. Now looking at them, you'd think that they were moon rocks or something, but these larger pieces are primarily composed of steel. In subsequent days, I'll spark test each of these pieces, large and small, roughly categorizing them by carbon content. At this point, carbon content is all over the map in these pieces. So they'll be stacked, forge welded, and then repeatedly cut, restacked, re-welded until a homogeneous steel suitable for sword making is produced. In some other videos, I'll show other parts of the process. I'll link here in the cards and descriptions to my playlist of videos showing other aspects of my work on Japanese style swords, including forging and a lot of other cool stuff. Thanks for watching, guys. If you feel like you got something out of this video, don't forget to subscribe. Also, click on the link to Patreon for a great way to give back to the channel. Plus, check me out on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Links in the description. If you want something sharp and pointy, maybe a gift for yourself or one of the cooler people in your life, check out my Tactics Armory website and pick up one of our tactical or outdoor knives. And finally, if you want to learn to make hamons or Japanese swords, check out waltersorrelsblades.com where you can find videos about how I make hamons as well as forging, mounting, polishing, and fittings for Japanese swords. Thanks and see you soon!